<laughs> Good morning and welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, the rain is back. After a summer-like day yesterday, we're back to fall and rain, but uh, it's warm and dry in here. We're glad you have come to gather together on this special Sunday in the life of our church. Uh, wrapping up our theme of faith and mental health this month of October, a message today from our friend uh, Deacon in our church and doctor in our community, Dr. Al Ozinski, who will be bringing our message today. Very much looking forward to that. I forgot my name tag, but don't you forget yours. There's name tags out on the board out on the narthex there, and if you need a name tag, there's a pan, uh, clipboard there on the counter there to let us know, and we will get you a name tag. If you haven't already done so, please re register your attendance on the friendship pad, especially if you're visiting with us today, and I'd like to acknowledge some special visitors, Derek, uh, Preston's parents, Mike and Julie, are visiting with us today from North Carolina, right? Yes, welcome. Glad to have you with us today. They raised a wonderful son, and he's raising a wonderful family along with Leanne. We're so glad that they are a part of our church family. Well, as we prepare our hearts for worship, it's a special day with children and a, a solo from Art J, and it's very important uh, time in our country and in our world. Uh, there's so much going on. It's good to be together in worship and prayer this day. So let us prepare ourselves for our call to worship. Please stand when you hear the bells. We are called to love the Lord our God. We are called to love the Lord our God. We are called to love the Lord our God. Come, let us worship God together. Standing is. We pause now to acknowledge our need for God's grace in our lives as we seek to love God and love neighbor. First, we will join in a unison prayer and then pause for a moment of silent and personal confession. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we need to confess that we find it hard to love as you ask us to. It is easy to love you, except when you ask us to love our neighbor. We find it hard to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. Forgive us, loving God. As you took a risk in creating us, help us to take risks to love others, to love ourselves, and to love you as completely as you love us. Amen. Friends, as we lift our heads from this time of prayer, we do so with confidence. The scriptures remind us that as far as the east is from the west, so far as God removed our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are indeed forgiven. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. Now, 
Okay, let us go to prayer and we will conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, we come to you this day to worship in your sanctuary. While we feel safe within these walls, there are many around the world who do not feel safe, especially the children of Gaza, Ukraine, and now the people of Lewiston, Maine. There's trouble in our world, but in you there is hope and even joy as we celebrate our love for you and one another. We especially thank you for our children. We pray for their safety as they celebrate and have fun on Halloween this week. On this day of worship, we pray also for our Jewish brothers and sisters in Mount Kisco as they gather to remember those taken hostage in the recent attacks. As Isaiah and Jesus both declared, the Spirit of the Lord has come to proclaim release to the captives. We pray for their safe and quick release. We also pray for the innocent people of Gaza who are caught in this terrible crisis. May there be your shalom in that troubled part of the world. We pray for the people of Lewiston, Maine, as they grieve and yet uh, this uh, grieve yet another senseless loss of life due to gun violence. Help us find better ways to love you and our neighbor. We pray all these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first reading today comes from Psalm 8, verses 1 through 9. If you notice, that was what our opening hymn was based on, the beautiful imagery of Psalm 8. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the, all the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends. Can you hear me in the back? Second reading. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and he answered that, the kingdom of God is coming not with things that can be observed, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you and among you. In Matthew 22:36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The word of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto you, O God, my Lord and my Redeemer. So, you know, Dale asked me to do this talk today, and I'm quite honored, and I'm likely to do anything that um, Dale asked me to do because he, because he loves me and I love him so much. And, uh, 
you know, I, I've said to myself, I'll do this talk. I prayed about it, I, uh, this is what came out, and I said, if it's a flop, I'll blame Dale <laughs> and his poor judgment. <laughs> but here we go. My, my husband, Richard, thought it was maybe, he feared it would be a little too long. There's several things I've done to help us with that. I've broken it up into four parts. Each part has a title, so we know where we are in the, in the talk. And um, on my first day of medical school, I'll share with you that the professor walked up to the podium. He said, grab onto your seats. We're going up to warp He said, your attention, please. We're going up to warp speed. Our attention was wrapped. It was amazing what we heard in the last hour. Um, uh, there's a lot in it. It's emotionally impactful. Um, we'll begin. I began my career as a psychiatric social worker before attending medical school. I'm now a board-certified adult <coughs> and child and adolescent psychiatrist. Though I work in a beautiful suburban hospital, I work daily with the severely mentally ill, the addicted, the homeless, and the very poor. My professional work has been my Christian mission. My talk, talk today will be a short overview of how I got here, what I have learned, and how things look through my eyes. Part one, a few definitions. Mental health includes emotional, psychological, and spiritual well-being. It influences perception, thoughts, beliefs, behavior, and self-regard. It is a condition wherein one has realized his abilities, copes effectively with stresses of life, and works productively, and contributes to his community. In the words of Sigmund Freud, it's the ability to love and to work. Health, physical, or mental is a matter of balance and often granted through the benevolent circumstances of birth by nature and nurture. It is usually taken for granted until the balance is disturbed. When we, we then search to right the balance again. Spiritual well-being can be defined as the honoring of meaning of existence or an expression of the sacred. It involves development of a personal belief system and often sharing in community or in relating to a higher power. It emphasizes the experiences of the individual, is subjective, not limited to doctrine, having to do with the human spirit. The word spiritual is derived from spiritus, relating to the Latin breath or inspiration. Spirituality is not to be, oh, spiritual well-being can be defined as, wait one second, I've lost my, my place. Spirituality is not to be confused with religion, which is an organized system of belief, ritual, and custom in a cultural context through the consent of the many. It emphasizes tradition, mythology, and history. It brings individuals to a shared sense of the sacred. The word religion derives from the Latin word religios, which means to bind together. The need to understand life's basic questions is universal. The questions of where did we come from, where are we going, why, what is meaningful, through all t of time and all cultures, whether one is atheist or not, across the lifespan, for children as well as adults. Some address and resolve these questions with spiritual awareness and understanding. Spiritual, spiritual well-being can often not be taken for granted, but must be sought out and maintained as well. As a social worker, I got to study the implications of the social environment on health. As a psychiatrist, I get to think not only about the mind, but also about the brain and the effect of the environment on brain, mind, and body. Thus, modern psychiatry works with a biopsychosocial model. And some of us psychiatrists uphold a biopsychospiritual model of health and wellness. For sure, some mental illness is based fully on genetics. However, environmental stresses, nurturance, or lack thereof affects the health of organ systems, and particularly the nervous system. Thus, much mental illness is induced by psychosocial stress. Mental health professionals treat with medications and psychotherapy. There's a common myth that mental illness, once acquired, doesn't heal, and though that is the case for some diseases, not true for others. For medically recognized illnesses, one is not assumed to carry a diagnosis through life, 
We assume little of one who had a broken bone, or had a virus, or had cancer, and to assume that all mental illness is, uh, mental illness is permanent is erroneous. I'm here to bring the new good news about healing. Dale refers to a mental health crisis in our time. He attempts to explore why this is occurring, and perhaps our national politics are reflective of the mental health crisis. Have we slid from a nation of, out of many, one, into greed and complacency and you do you? Have we become a world that sees the earth and those in it as something to exploit for one's own purposes rather than integrating as a family on a planet that needs to be cared for? The way we use technology has served to deceive and distance us. We've become atomized with people more and more living in their own worlds. We live in a 24-hour international negative news cycle. In our disease, medication might help with symptoms, but it can't overcome the basic facts of one's life. Whether one is incarcerated or going through divorce, being bullied, dealing with discrimination, or with loneliness, and a pill cannot change the fact that we live in a bitterly divided country where gun violence is common and the effects of climate change are obvious. A large portion of the population lives in poverty and a world with increasing financial disparity and bigotry persists. Societal ills often become personal ills. So what do we do with this problem of overwhelming stress? I'm going to take a breath after each paragraph, each part. So, part two, I call testimony. I honor your unique path, which can be nothing but unique. No two of us are comparable. I cannot presume to know what your experience has been, what you should think, or feel, or believe, or what your path to healing should be. But I can share with you a little of my own story and my mental health journey to gain wholeness. I'll begin. I grew up in a family of seven children in a housing project and resources were meager. When I was a little boy, my father developed a mental illness that was not understood and we suffered under ignorance, stigma, fear, as well as the shame of poverty. Rehabilitation was not available in those days. There was little in the way of treatment, nor was there any sort of safety net other than what came out of churches. I came from a background of abuse and neglect of a physical and emotional nature. And my brother, too, developed a mental illness from which he never recovered, but he ultimately committed suicide. I developed depression in my early adolescence and was in isolation, in daily pain, which was so severe that in my, much of my late adolescence, in early adulthood, I had suicidal thoughts on more days than I could ever count. Ultimately, in my early 20s, I experienced a psychotic depression. I stopped sleeping. And, for, and as days rolled into weeks, I experienced delusions and hallucinations. I was in a nightmare that I could not awaken from. I was in a hell and tortured by fear and grief that was undeserved, but beyond belief. Medications were for sure important, but it was not so much the medications that made me fully well, but the loving care of the many psychotherapists, ministers, and counselors that helped me develop the needed depth of understanding of myself, of my experience, circumstances, and the needed understanding I needed to develop about humanity. It took me years to freely talk about my history of trouble. I felt like an ex-convict who carried a deep shame and feared the judgment of others for having stepped over the line into severe mental illness. I will share other strands of my life which are important and intertwined. I left the Catholic Church when I was 12. I had been told that the Pope gets to forgive sins, gets to elevate others to sainthood, whereby they became special entities in the spirit world that we could pray to for intervention. Eating meat on a Friday would blacken my soul. I was told that Mary was a virgin, and I thought that the idea of a woman who has a baby without sex was preposterous and a lot of, out of line with what my sense of what is real. And for me, what was real really, really mattered. We were told what to believe if we were to be good Catholics. We were not to question what was, for me, not sensible. I became an atheist for years because I couldn't reconcile religion and its myths with science and logic. 
I was very sad about it, though. Actually, my heart was broken. I got into college by a fluke. There wasn't money for tuition. I thought that I would have to work for years to make college happen. So I hadn't made any preparation. Little did I know that I had won a full state supported scholarship due to my grade performance on a statewide regents exam. The school never bothered to inform me, neither did the state, not by letter or phone call. My mother happened to discover it by reading my name in a local paper. I scrambled to find a spot in a state school on that date in late March. I found a spot. Getting into college was for me like making it over the Berlin Wall. I had gotten out of the housing project without being killed. There, but for the grace of God, go I. I left behind many other smart people who never made it out. When I was in college and continuing to look for truth, my physics professor told me not to look to science to find truth, but the, to the philosopher. Science can never tell you what is true, only what is not true. Science rules things out and reality is too big, he said. I had my marching orders to see the philosopher. I took a class in the philosophy of religion. My professor presented a logical proof that demonstrated that it made much, as much sense to believe in God as to not believe in God. I thought, wow, we have a logical choice then. It was like he was saying, one can see the glass is half empty or half full, and one can make a choice about how to look at it. I asked myself what choice would make me happy and decided that I would be happier viewing the universe as alive and that it cared for me. Sometime later, I fell in love for the first time, and I walked alone onto the porch early one morning. I literally felt that the birds had called me outside. Everything was more still than it had ever been. I felt that the sky and the sun and the trees were acknowledging me and whispering, yet without words, I love you. There was a spirit behind it all that had called me, and I was awed and grateful. This, this was my first true experience of God. I was converted from atheist to believer in an instant. One can't argue with such an experience. Perhaps this was a calling from within my soul, looking out into the mirror of the universe, which was reflecting something that had not been previously within me. Perhaps it was a love for myself, which I had learned by way of the love of someone else. In subsequent years, my girlfriend and I broke up. Despite how much we loved each other, it didn't work, was not meant to be. It was then that I became very sick with my own mental illness, as I referred to earlier. I was in so much pain that I surely wanted to die. I was so afraid. It was then that I reached for Jesus. I'd previously explored Eastern religion and had discovered there a more experiential approach to God than generally exists in the intellectualized West. I had discovered a notion of God who was not separate and distant from but within his creation. Then, I was, when I was completely helpless and most vulnerable, I reached to a place of safety. I asked if I could follow Jesus. The leader of the Sikh ashram where I had been studying graciously said to me, Jesus, Ram Das, they are both spirits in the cosmos and always available to you. The world became wholly round for me that day. I was in peace and could let go. A tortured soul could rest in the arms of God and fully heal in their trust. I found a grace in which I live to this day. Breathe. Next paragraph. Part three, art and science. My religious experiences didn't mean I gave up on science. I'm taking science with me. But I noticed some things with new eyes, which I will share. Rupert Sheldrake, a biochemist, biochemist at Cambridge and a Harvard scholar said, modern science is based on the principle of, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. And the free miracle is the appearance of all energy and matter of the universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. Albert Einstein said, the most beautiful and profound emotion that we can experience 
is the sensation of the mystical. It's at the root of all true science. That deeply emotional conviction of the essence of a superior reasoning power which is revealed in an incomprehensible universe is my idea of God. He also said, religion without science is blind. Science without religion is lame. You might think that our scientists sound a little poetic, but let me share with you a little from Emily Dickinson, who says something quite precise in her poem about the human brain. The brain is wider than the sky, for put them side by side, the one the other will contain, with ease, and you beside. The brain is deeper than the sea, for hold them blue to blue, the one the other will absorb, as sponges buckets do. The brain is just the weight of God, or half them pound for pound, and they will differ if they do as syllable from sound. She gives a, a, a profound view that couldn't be spoken in any other way. Truly, a full understanding of life is through art as well as science. Breathe, part four, conclusions. In my study of child psychiatry, I concluded that children are not much different than adults. Given a few years' experience, children want to be cared for and respected, and they want freedom to make choices. Adults sometimes cling to fairy tales. They want when they want when they want it. They tantrum. They're afraid. Maturing into mental health requires giving up on fantasy, but as Albert Einstein said, we become, explored, we become inspired to explore what is possible in the mysterious and not in magic. We all need to sense the mystical to understand and appreciate existence. Humankind is challenged by the difficult and ultimately fatal challenge of life. To address this coping task, we have a need to create, and create we do. We create beauty out of the ugly, joy from sorrow, rebirth from death, ability from disability, order from chaos, knowledge from the unknown. Such is the regenerative ability of the human mind. It springs from a deep need as strong as any human drive. To create, we use art and science. As therapists, we assist others to create new ways of relating to their emotions, thoughts, be beliefs, and relationships. We provide witness and acceptance so that the patient can learn to give it to himself. We can sometimes say, been there. Sometimes we can just be there. What have I learned from my journey as a child in pain, as a scientist, from Catholicism, through atheism, to Eastern religion, and through my return to my own culture, seeking salvation and peace within the Christian story and trusting the love within it, to my, to my work first as a patient and then as a mental health professional, I learned that we all have a story. We all suffer. We are all on a search for the living water of creation to transcend our suffering. If the expression of Voltaire is true, that if God did not exist, then man would have had to create him, then I say, it doesn't matter. We create, and because we are a part of the creation, it's likely that the creator living within us does so create. It's the human need to be a part of something larger than ourselves, because we indeed are a part of something greater. We complete and need each other. I have found my spirit. I have found my God. I have found my Christ. I have found my religion. I seek to guide others in the art of finding their own. We are to give to life everything that we have as life gives to us. I come to church to hang out with good people who are wanting to do good and you the same. I have heard a miracle defined as the removal of the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. 
I'm not here to trample on anyone else's theology, only to express little of the current state of my own and to get what I can out of yours and to grow in the process. I believe that the Bible is more literary than literal. I believe that Mary was just someone's Jewish mother, and if there are no virgin births, then I am to see the miraculous in all births. I believe that Jesus was just a man, and that he came here to show us about our divinity and the responsibility that comes with that. I believe that the second coming has already happened. Heaven is here if we want to see it, if we are willing to participate in creating it. I can only find Jesus in myself and in others, within me, within you. And that is my idea of resurrection, and my idea of mental health too. And that's plenty miracle for me. I will look, if you will allow me to, into your eyes, and I will ask in silent prayer. Jesus, will you meet me here? Amen. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is. May we always behold Christ within ourselves and within each other. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.